Robotic exoskeletons, or powered exoskeletons, are considered wearable robotic units controlled by computer boards to power a system of motors, pneumatics, levers, or hydraulics to restore locomotion. The topic of exoskeletons is timely given the number of devices currently being studied as well as purchased by facilities for rehabilitation purposes in medical centers or for home use. Exoskeletons have emerged as an advantageous rehabilitation tool for disabled individuals with spinal cord injury, SCI. In this video, we'll delve more into this. So sit back, relax, and make sure you watch to the end. First, let's talk about the current applications of exoskeletons. Different brands of powered exoskeletons are now commercially available for SCI rehabilitation with different levels of injury. However, there is still a limited accessibility to exoskeletons in clinical settings, partly because of their prohibitive cost and the high level of training required before supervising individuals with SCI. Despite these limitations, limited research and anecdotal evidence support the use of exoskeleton to improve quality of life and health-related medical conditions after SCI. Previous excellent reviews have summarized and highlighted the potential benefits of using exoskeleton for rehabilitation of persons with SCI. It is crucial before expanding the applications of exoskeletons that we carefully analyze the available research and clinical evidence regarding this technology. Considering the limited data and or small sample size of the current published studies, it is premature to draw solid conclusions about the efficacy of exoskeletons in maximizing rehabilitation outcomes or ameliorating several of the health-related consequences following SCI. Safety and Efficacy of Exoskeletons From the clinical health perspective, several reports have demonstrated that exoskeleton training is safe and likely to be used in different settings to encourage overground ambulation. A recent study that involved nine European rehabilitation centers demonstrated the safety, feasibility, and training characteristics in persons with SCI following eight work of training. Out of 52 participants, three dropped out following ankle swelling and four presented with grade 2 pressure injury but managed to continue the study. Personal communication indicated that fracture may occur at the distal tibia or calcaneus bone during exoskeleton walking. Potential health benefits have been highlighted for the use of exoskeletons in rehabilitation settings and studies have examined the effects of exoskeletons on different health-related outcomes. Fitting time across different brands. Most of the current brands require special measurements to custom fit participants before doffing. This may require special adjustments for persons with SCI in case there is leg length discrepancy, pelvic obliquity, sever muscle wasting, or even highly sensitive skin, which may require up to two to three sessions to accomplish this task. This motor learning capability may vary from one patient to another and may require three to five days of continuous training to grasp this procedure. As the technology advances, different manufacturers will develop their products to be simply fitted to the participants in a short time and provide variable options for persons with wide motor learning capabilities. Exoskeletons and Levels of SCI Persons with tetraplegia represent 55% of the SCI population. The current technology is FDA approved to be used for those with C7 and below SCI, primarily because of safety concerns. The level of injury cutoff was set because reasonable hand functions are required to hold the assistive device and to initiate weight shifting during stepping and walking. Lack of appropriate hand grip may eliminate a considerable number of this population from benefiting from this technology. This means that a large segment with C1, C5 level of injury may be ineligible to benefit from this technology. This technology may be beneficial to those with C4, C8 level of SCI or even higher level of injury, similar to cases diagnosed with locked-in syndrome. Exoskeletons and physical activity. Physical inactivity is a key feature following SCI, which is likely to lead to a sedentary lifestyle and increased sitting time. 
Prolonged sitting time has been shown to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, cancer, as well as a factor for increasing all-cause mortality. A very important point that needs to be considered is low metabolic cost during exoskeleton training. Exoskeletons and bone health. 60% of individuals with SCI suffer from osteopenia or osteoporosis, a progressive disease that leads to bone loss, especially in the distal femur and proximal tibia. Bone remodeling and demineralization is a continuous process, and it is a function of both osteoblastic and osteoclastic activities. The pattern of bone loss in persons with SCI differs from other clinical population, and it is commonly referred to as neurogenic osteoporosis. Bone loss occurs sublesionally at a rapid rate and approaching 1% of bone mineral density per week. Most of bone loss occurs within the first 12 to 24 months after SCI and reaches steady state within 3 to 8 years post-injury. Exoskeleton and pressure injuries. It is well documented that 70%, 75% of persons with SCI experience pressure injuries during their lifetime with dramatic changes in their skin structures that are likely to break down with a minimal amount of shear. This should make us cautious about choosing the appropriate candidate, utilizing their past medical history to identify those likely to benefit from exoskeleton use without exposure to such shear stress. Current challenges facing community use. The transition from hospital setting to rehabilitation use or community ambulation requires the need of a well-trained caregiver. It is likely to be challenging for persons with SCI to identify a dedicated caregiver who is willing to dedicate the time and effort to support their partner during exoskeleton ambulation. Work-related commitment, divorce, liability, in case of falling or injury, have been identified as precluding factors to having a committed caregiver. The cost and standard wheelchair. Finally, the current cost of this equipment is prohibitive and may interfere with accessibility in the developed countries as well as less developed parts of the world. The cost may drop with increased numbers of emerging brands and studies demonstrating their efficacy. However, policymakers and governments need to determine whether the technology deserves widespread application such that medical insurance can offer an exoskeleton unit per patient similar to a wheelchair. As of now, it remains unclear whether this emerging technology offers benefits beyond the existing standard of care, such as a regular wheelchair or a standing frame. Moreover, it is time to establish roundtable discussions including individuals with SCI government and health policymakers, researchers, and rehabilitation specialists to develop rigorous plans for the future of exoskeletons. Here you have it for today's video. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you like, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our future videos and share this video if you think it's worth sharing.